So, uh, I guess we're doing that again. Welcome to the F tier Nuzlocke. Two popular YouTubers, Flygon HG and Pokemon Challenges, both known for their Nuzlocke prowess, have each made their own tier list for Pokemon, telling us what they consider to be the worst of the worst encounters in each game. And that sets the stage for our challenge today, where we will only be using Pokemon considered to be F tier. Standard hardcore Nuzlocke rules apply, Let's jump into the run. Skipping straight to picking up our starter, we go with Tepig. Embor is obviously a very good Pokemon, which means he won't be sticking around in our team for long. We just need him to get through a few mandatory battles and to set us up for success a bit later. You'll see what I mean. After beating our rival in his Oshawa, we're free to travel to the next town over, where we almost get completely squished by former champion, now weird old man, Alder. He directs us to find our rival, so we head off to do exactly that. But it's time we get this run started for real. There are two more mandatory battles before we're able to reach our first viable encounter, but since they're single Pokemon trainers on the first route, I think it's safe to assume they won't affect the outcome of this run too much. On Route 20, we are able to find a Sunkern. Unfortunately, for the time we are playing this, Sunkern is a bit rarer of an encounter, but after a bit of illegal time hopping, we're able to find one and finally catch the first member of our team. Thanks for the start, Tepig. We'll take it from here. I made a big deal last time about how the first encounter usually sets the nickname theme for me, which is how we landed on musical composers after we got our starter Cricketune. This time, however, names stumped me. I tried to name him Daffodil before realizing I just don't have the slightest bit of faith in myself to spell that properly, and I'm too lazy to Google it. So Daffy is added to the team. With Daffy on our team and a strategy in mind, that's it. A single Sunkern is the only Pokemon we are allowed to have for the entirety of the early game and through the first gym. That's not a sentence you want to hear explained to you as a Nuzlocker, but damn it if it doesn't just make me more inclined to try. Our Sunkern does easily take out our rival's Oshawa when we run into him at the ranch, the first of many gifts our Tepig Choice gave us. Our rival then freaks out about a lost dog, who we immediately go find being held hostage by some kind of space pirate. After being called a fool, like, excuse me, the proper term is Jester, if you're going to insult me, do it properly. We gain the TM for frustration and make our way back to where Alder is waiting for us. And here is where we can reap some more rewards from our Tepic choice. Alder uses us to teach his students about type matchups. What this actually means is that the first student we face has a Pokemon weak to our starter choice, and the second one uses the Pokemon strong against our starter choice. Because our only viable encounter this early was always going to be Sunkern, we can rig these fights in our favor by choosing Tepig, forcing the first fight to be a neutral match, and the second one to actually be one where we have the advantage instead of that advantage being flipped. When life gives you Sunkerns, strategize like every fight may be your last. Of course, with frustration in tow, we have neutral move against Pansage, and Panpour is obviously a breeze. Grass will soon growth really are just cherries on top for our little Daffy. I'm so proud of my little Sprout. So let's put him to the test. In the first gym, we aren't able to challenge Sharon until we take on the other two trainers protecting him. The first one leads to the Pat Trap, which is put to sleep turn one. After a growth, we barely miss the two-hit KO, but do finish it off without despair. Lilypup comes in next, and despite a tackle forcing our Orenberry gift from Alder, we do get the two-hit KO thanks to a critical hit Mega Drain. Second trainer leads Lilypup, who I find out the hard way cannot be put to sleep, but no matter. We get Leech Seed up on it while it spams status moves and KO with a Mega Drain. Patrick isn't much better, but after a turn one Leary tackle knocks us down to half, activating our second Orin Berry. Of course, that only happened because of a Grass Whistle miss, which doesn't happen twice, although it gets the turn one wake up anyway. It goes for Leer while we get a big Mega Drain off, fully healing and picking up the two hit KO. These fights are telling me that I really am underestimating how much raw damage Sunkern will deal without having to rely on Leech Seed and Grass Whistle, but I guess better safe than sorry, and no sense getting cocky right before the gym leader fight. Sharon leads with Patrat, who hits us with a tackle while we can put it to sleep. It actually stays asleep three turns, allowing us to get off both a Leech Seed and two growths before it wakes up and retaliates with the tackle. Unfortunately for it, we hit back with a Mega Drain, heal most of the damage back up, and Leech Seed cleans up the kill. Up comes in next and we decide to go for raw damage, but even at plus two, our Mega Drain doesn't even do half, despite it being now one level lower than our Sunkern. Tackle knocks Daffy to yellow with just 11 HP remaining, but we get off the second Mega Drain. Tackle may still be in range for a KO, but because we knocked the up to red, Sharon is inclined to heal, clearing us to get a second Mega Drain off. That means we have now healed enough HP to definitely survive another tackle, which hits and drops Daffy to six HP, but Mega Drain KOs. Arguably the shakiest leg of the journey is over, and surprisingly easily. I guess when you're able to heal consistently, even paper thin defense are enough to keep you up. That's about as much detail as I'm going to get into for any random trainer fights coming up. I wanted to be a bit more detailed about the early game with Sunkern, just because I thought it might be the trickiest part of the run. But once we start getting more tools at our disposal, these vanilla trainers really aren't worth going over. Fun fact, Shaking Grass does not occur in Black and White 2 until after you get the first gym badge. And now that that hurdle is behind us, we can unlock our next encounter, which takes a lot longer to find than I care to admit. But once we do get our 5% encounter, Sylvester the Dunsparce is added to the team, and spoiler alert, Dunsparce is a powerhouse of a Pokemon. With his ability Serene Grace, Dunsparce is able to take advantage of one of the wackiest moves in the game, which in Black and White 2 it learns at just level 19. 
Ancient Power. Ancient Power has a 10% chance to boost every one of the user's stats. Now, 10% isn't a lot, but doubled to 20%? That's basically one in five. And how much PP does Ancient Power have? That's right, bud, you guessed it. Five. All this together means that Dunsparce is basically guaranteed to get Omni Boost in every fight. Listen, I'm fully aware that's not how percentages and chance works. Just go with me on this one, okay? Anyway, second gym. Just like before, there are two trainers to take on before challenging the leader. Neither one poses much of an issue, though the first one does bring Sylvester's HP down low things to poison, but with Yon being able to put Pokemon to sleep between beatdowns of a turn, we're never in any real danger here. After a quick heal and bury up, it's time to get our second badge. We lead Sylvester against Roxy's Coughing, who we outspeed and promptly obliterate with a critical hit return. The crit there definitely mattered, but it just changed a two shot to a one shot. Return is pretty OP for this part of the game. Whirlipede comes in next and we take it out with two uses of return, while Venishok still leaves us above half HP. Sylvester gets his first sweep of the run, and it will not be his last. Immediately after our victory, we are forced into some Pokestar Studio stuff that for all our sakes we will skip, and then have to take on Team Plasma before we are able to leave town. Fortunately, most of Plasma's grunts are complete pushovers, and beating this one with our new level cap does give us access to the almighty ancient power. Now we watch as we slowly go mad with power. We aren't allowed to show mercy and are forced to chase down the fleeing grunts, but after a quick second match, we are free to finally boat off to Castelia City, where we are blocked from entering the gym since the leader is off chasing Plasma. Again. Fortunately, Iris shows up and leads us to where we gotta go. We plunge into the sewers alongside our rival, face off with Plasma in a quick double battle, then Berg reveals himself and skedaddles back to the gym where he belongs. Colbris also makes his first appearance here. He's the crazy scientist guy with a weird blue hair thing, and he's also like super cool. We ignore them both for now though and move to get our next encounter in the entrance where Colbris just emerged from. Here we can pick up Sam the Onyx after a bit of running around. Now, I'm fully aware I missed quite a bit in these sewers, including but not limited to more encounters. But don't worry, we'll be back here before too long. I honestly didn't even think about it because I fully expected Sylvester to just sweep most of the game. Picking up Onyx was just to add some bulk to the team, but even he won't see much use in this next gym. A bit of zipping through cocoons later and we start our battle against the third gym leader. If you don't see how this is going to go, we want to lead Sylvester against Swadloon because Swadloon is bulky enough to take multiple hits while not dealing much damage in return. And Pokemon like that are exactly the kind of Pokemon that Sylvester wants to be facing, as they give the highest chance of boosting with Ancient Power. True to that, after just one use of the move, we already get our boost. And following that, the second use while Swadloon is asleep actually gives us a second boost. It's completely over from here. Dwebble does hang on twice with Sturdy thanks to Berg's Potion, but it really doesn't matter. Smackdown does so little against our plus two defense Sylvester that we're still over half HP when Levandi comes out. He does outspeed us, likely thanks to Swadloon's turn one string shot, and hangs on with just a sliver of HP to activate a Citrus Berry. But it's too little too late. Razor Leaf doesn't crit, not that I think he had a KO even with it, and a second return seals Levandi's fate. Our third badge is delivered. North of Castelia, we meet up with Colrus, who has found a way to weaponize crabs, and that's a horrifying prospect to think about. Anyway, he challenges us to a Pokemon battle too. Magnemite trades statuses with Sylvester by paralyzing with Thunder Wave while it falls asleep to yawn. Magnemite does get the turn one wake up, but Sylvester gets an Omni Boost after his third Ancient Power. I'll point out that the constant Sandstorm this route only works in Colrus' favor due to his Steel types, but now that we have a defensive boost, our newly learned Roost works wonders keeping us alive throughout the fight. Our fourth Ancient Power doesn't give the boost, but does secure the KO thanks to the special attack buff. With Clink in, we have one less chance for our AP boost, but it doesn't happen. Fortunately, Clink misses a gear grind in the same turn, so I guess that trade is okay. Our return puts Clink into the red, forcing Pulveris to heal on the next turn. Two more returns get the KO, all while staying around half HP, despite gear grinding and sandstorm chip damage. With Colrus done and out of the way, we are free to get our next encounter at the entrance to the desert resort. Maractus does give us some trouble, but eventually our second carry for this run, Penelope, is added to the team. Maractus gets access to Accupressure, a status move that sharply raises a random stat. With a little bit of luck and enough turns to use it, we can play for special attack boosts that will super buff Giga Train. Not to mention this move can also give evasion buffs, so we'll see if that ever comes into play. Before we enter into Mossa City, we gain access to Join Avenue. This was a really cool feature in these games where you could have NPCs set up shops that you could upgrade to get useful rewards and is not something we have time for today. This is probably as good a time as any to mention that these games cannot be enjoyed to their fullest anymore. Thanks to Nintendo shutting down the online services for these games, you no longer have access to the Dream World, which in this game was the only way to access berry farming and quite a few other features. Up until this point, I've limited myself to Oran Berries because I did get them from Alter, and technically with Dream World we would have been able to plant them, and added to that just the few gift citrus berries we got along the way. But since the other main way to obtain citrus berries is through Join Avenue, I go ahead and unlock those for myself after the next gym. In Namasa City, we run into the Not Protagonist and a sister with a double battle against the two coolest characters Pokemon ever created, Ingo and Emmett. Unfortunately, they're a bit of a pushover in this fight specifically, with Not Protag survive doing most of the work. With that done, it's time for the gym. Elisa leads with a Molga against Sam, but it can only hit us with Pursuit, meaning we are free to set up Stealth Rocks and spam Smackdown until it eventually faints. But thanks to Onyx's low attack stat, 
It doesn't get the two at KO, and actually baits Elisa into using her potion in the process. Good job, Sam. Blafey comes in and again only has one move for Onyx in takedown, which is resisted. Even with Onyx's minuscule attack, Flafy damaging itself will more than make up for it, and eventually it falls. We're banking on a free switch here since Substrika has Pursuit, which plays out perfectly with Sam absorbing the hit and switching into Sylvester. The Zebra falls asleep between two turns of Volt switching, and without waking up, it falls shortly after. Four badges in hand, we have another obstacle in our way to the next, a mandatory triple battle against this biker guy. Normally, this fight isn't too bad, but with how hectic doubles get, I'm not risking anything once we crank that up to three. We lead Sam, Sylvester, and Penelope against his Archon, Sigilyph, and Tortuga, setting ourselves up so that Sam isn't near Tortuga, and Penelope isn't near Archon. Not that it matters too much, since flying moves can usually reach the other side, but I digress. I'm not going to try to break this one out. Things happen, stuff dies, but not us, and we get to move on. The next gem seems a little buggy, because I don't think it was intended to be this dark without ever lighting up, but whatever. We stumble our way to Clay and demand our next badge. His Croc Rock lead is no match for Penelope, who blows him up with a quick Giga Drain. When Sand Slash comes in next, we again outspeed and again KO with Giga Drain. Excadrill actually puts up a decent fight here, though. We outspeed the first turn, Croc is Citrus Berry, but Excadrill retaliates with Metal Claw, which does some decent damage. We again outspeed, but Giga Drain only brings him down to red before he goes for speed control and hits us with Bulldoze. The next turn, Clay is free to heal up, and Penelope can only bring him back down to yellow. Unfortunately, now Excadrill outspeeds, and he hits us with a rock slide that Penelope flinches from. Uh oh. We stay in, knowing we take at least one more hit, and this time he doesn't get the flinch chance, and we are able to get a KO with the last Giga Drain. With our fifth badge secured, we unlock what is probably my favorite area of these games, the Pokemon World Tournament. Down here, we also have a move tutor and all kinds of stuff. The battle items we can unlock with BP are well worth it too. The first and only tournament we have available to us is the Driftvale Tournament. I think this one is mandatory too, and features our rival Sharon and Colrus, but for some reason, all their Pokemon are only level 25, and my own level cap just went up to 39, so like, Let's just skip to the end. Story stuff happens where Plasma decides to turn up here for some reason, and obviously our rival is like, nah, -uh, no, they didn't, and runs after them. So fine, I do too. At least these guys are level 30, but they still don't stand much of a chance against Sylvester. Penelope takes a backseat here against poison types. We get into some double battles too, where Sharon now has a level 33 Pokemon? Like, were you even trying to win the tournament literally 30 seconds ago? And how did Hugo's Duat go from 25 to 33? The lack of consistent storytelling is really ruining my immersion here. Anyway, after the evil Captain Sage guy, blathers about his evil plan and kicks us off the ship, we finally unlock the rest of the tournaments available to us in the PWT, including, but not limited to, the rental tournament. This means we could spam the tournament for BP over and over and over without ever risking our actual Pokemon. Cool, infinite BP it is. After a shopping spree, we're moving on to the next route with the Weather Institute, where we meet with Sharon and get the HM for Surf. Now that we have that, it's time for some backtracking to a place I forgot, the Castelia Subers. The first place I want to hit is the secret Castelia Garden, where we get another encounter of Skitty. Having completely skipped the place earlier, we're still clear to get our encounter here but unfortunately the same cannot be said for Zubat in the sewers themselves, as we definitely ran into one here before and I just smooth brained over it. Anyway, Lola makes it onto the team and we start to patrol the sewers for items we missed before, including a heart scale and leftovers, both of which we need for upcoming fights. Taking our brand new Skitty and our heart scale back to the PWT, we teach her Fake Out, which can only be relearned, then pick up a Moonstone next to the Weather Institute and evolve her into a Delcaddy. See, I didn't forget. I was just waiting until I had access to everything at once. Yeah. That's it. Anyway, moving through the route, we almost get headbutt by a weird deer who turns tail and runs off, probably expecting me to follow it. But no sir, that sounds like work. And in a run where we are settling for trash tier Pokemon, work is not something I'm looking to do. And our final move before we get on our way, we just need one more encounter. On this route, we have two possible choices, Kara Blast and Cast Form. While neither are great, Cast Form is infinitely better than Kara Blast, so we grind again forever to find one in Shaking Grass, spamming Repel to keep Kara Blast away. My loss and sanity aside, we do finally get our Cast Form, name her Tweety, and add her to the party. Cast Form has base 70 stats across the board, which means it's never great, but by our standards, is never the worst either. What's most important here is that Cast Form is literally our only Ice type, and since we don't have access to Ice Beam until post game, we don't get the type coverage either. We have a chance for a Pile of Swine later, but it shares a location with Delibird, and I'm not liking my odds of that coin flip landing in my favor. And in a game with a heavy dragon dominance, we're going to be relying on this Tweety Bird more than I care to admit. With maximum special attack and speed investment and access to an unlimited number of focus sashes, we're just building the ultimate glass cannon who will either one shot something or die trying. Nuzlocks are all about planning and preparation, and being able to take your time to forge the best strategies is my favorite part. Sure, some of that falls apart in the heat of battle, but the fun is setting yourself up for the best chance of success possible. I get to take my time doing that off camera for these kinds of runs, but if you want to see my thought process live, make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you can tune in to watch me stream right here. Currently, we're playing through Radical Red, 
and honestly, I could use all the help I can get. Hope to see you there. Channel plug aside, we finally get to move on. Bianca is waiting for us in Chargestone Cave, muttering something about shiny rocks. And here we get our next encounter and find ourselves a Nose Pass. Nose Pass really didn't get his chance to shine in our last run, where Onyx kind of had the advantage over him in every way. But this is Gen 5 now, baby. We have Evia Light and Volt Switch. Nose Pass has every tool it needs to be a tanky free switch whenever we need it. And it can hit decently well itself too, with Power Gem, Discharge, and Earth Power. And with so many other potential tools like Thunder Wave, Toxic, Bulldoze, man, if there was one Pokemon I was excited to use in this run, it was Dunsparce. But Nosepass is a close second. We name him Foghorn and get him on the team just in time before the flying type gym. Juniper is in the next town over. She gives us a master ball that I'm sure we'll use, and then she runs off. Skyla challenges us to visit her gym, and in spite of the annoying wind tunnel puzzle, we make our way to her and demand our next badge. A lot of badge demanding in this run. Skyla's Swoobat leads off with acrobatics while we try to put it to sleep with Yawn. Now that we've access to protect and leftovers to heal damage passively while we do, we can get it to sleep without a second thought. Sylvester is then free to fire off Ancient Powers, getting a boost from the second one and putting Swoobat into the red. Expecting Skyla to heal, we go for Ancient Power again, and leftovers brings us back to full HP. Really couldn't be doing much better for ourselves here, but it does turn around slightly when Swoobat wakes up and gets a critical hit acrobatics off, knocking Sylvester below half, but our final Ancient Power gives us another boost and finishes off the bat. I'll point out that Swoobat does have unaware, so we were never dealing boosted damage to it, but it is funny that it got a critical hit anyway, which also doesn't count stat increases. Too bad for it though, as Swoobat falls and Swana comes in next. We protect to heal just a bit more, but the next turn our plus two return gets a one hit KO. Skarmory in next has Sturdy, so we protect the first turn to get some health back, but it just ends up going for agility anyway. We like to put to sleep first, and it stays asleep while we get the three hit KO with the turn. These gym battles are too easy, extremely easy. I'm aware there's a more difficult game mode that I could have played on, but the general census I found online was that the higher level caps didn't necessarily make things harder. If anything, they skewed them in the player's favor. But some fights like this one would have at least added another Pokemon. I don't know if it would have made much of a difference, but I'd be amiss to not mention just how much of a breeze these gems are. Maybe things will stay this way, or maybe I'll be eating my own words here sooner than I think. Regardless, with Skyla defeated, Juniper joins us for a plane trip over to Reversal Mountain. Bianca stows away and escorts us through the cavern, where we also pick up our next encounter, Elmer the Numel. Camera up is a white 2 version exclusive and is the only reason why I chose to play white over black for this run. While fire ground typing isn't great defensively and its defensive stats are extremely lackluster, it does have early access to lava plume and earth power and a powerful special attack stat to boost a strong stab combination. Elmer makes a fine addition to the team and will definitely be important later. We leave Bianca behind and make our way up Route 13 into Lacanosa Town. I actually really loved how they expanded the Nova region with new areas and towns to visit in the sequels, but we don't have time to explore all that now. We have a one track mine and that mine has one question. How quickly can we get to to and defeat the LE4. Unfortunately, plot has to get in the way of that just a bit more by giving Juniper and Bianca teleporting powers and then forcing me to listen to an old lady's story about the Boogeyman. Honestly, this is a really cool way to introduce Kiram. Too bad we could already catch him in the previous games, but I guess this was before they decided it was okay to add Pokemon to sequel games. It just takes some of the wonder away here from him in my opinion. Plasma shows up again before we're allowed to leave and we're put into another double battle. We swap Penelope into Foghorn since we really have nothing to hit them with and decide to hit Discharge, which accidentally paralyzes our rival Samurott. A Rock Slide the next turn does KO the Crocodile but Foghorn falls low enough to activate his Citrus Berry, so we swap into Sylvester to finish out the fight. Eventually. Goddamn. Oh, hello, funny horse. Goodbye. Now that we're coming up to the seventh gym, I finally remember that we're allowed a gold bat, and we fly back to the tower Juniper was hiding out in to get one as a legal encounter. We name him Marvin and have him replace the Tranquil we were using as a fly user. With that out of the way, we climb Drayden's statue and get to challenge him for our next badge. The full power of Tweety was on display throughout the entire gym, and we get to see it showcased against the leader perfectly. Drayden leads with Dredigan, and while I misclick Blizzard instead of Hail on turn one, it turns out not to matter, as the attack lands anyway and Dredigan falls in a single hit. But not messing that up twice, we safely set up Hail and fire into Flygon with a times four super effective Blizzard the next turn. Next is Haxorus, who is outsped and also falls to our 100% accurate blizzard. Is it possible that cast form is too strong? After getting the badge, Drayden decides to tell us another story, and then we're ambushed by Plasma again. There's a few grunts to fight, but since they're nothing to write home about, let's skip up to their Coragonal toting sage once again. We swap Marvin out for Foghorn while Coragonal sets up Reflect. I try to power gem some damage out, but it isn't enough, and we Volt Switch on the next turn, bringing in Sylvester. At this point, I really should have the Eviolate already, yeah, yeah, I know, but it won't be long before we pick it up, I promise. Sylvester is confused on the next turn, but we follow up with a Yawn Protect combo, and luckily never hit ourselves in confusion. Fragonal does wake up pretty early, but our second Ancient Power gives us our boost and we're free to raise hell from there. We use a few Protects to keep our HP over half with leftovers and eventually 
actually get the KO. We use another Yawn Protect against the second Kragnal and use our last Age Power. But even without another boost, Return gets the KO the next turn. With Weavile in next and it having a high crit ratio move, we get it put to sleep as well, just in case Return doesn't get the KO for whatever reason. And good thing we did too, because Weavile does actually survive with just a sliver of HP. Fortunately, it stays asleep and falls to a second return. Potentially scary, but hey, we're clear of it now. Plasma runs off and we get to move on to Route 11, where we can pick up a Sviper. We name him Pepe and throw him in the box. There are a lot more encounters than I originally thought when coming up with my route for this game, which means a good number just won't see much use. I mean, as long as we have Sylvester and Penelope, I don't see how we'll need much else anyway. This run should be a breeze. And that, kids, is called foreshadowing. So let's see how this next part plays out. We now get to run through the awesome marine tube into Humalau City, where our rival is waiting for us. Of course, when we get there, he tells us to challenge the gym first. So we go fish out the gym leader from the ocean and make our way through his gym for a battle. We lead with Penelope. Is there really anything else I need to say? After our first acupressure gives us a special attack increase, we get a Giga Drain, which heals damage we took from Crunch and puts us back at full. Marlin then goes for a Shell Smash, but because he's in red, he tries to heal and we lock in a pedal dance, outspeeding and getting the two hit KO. With Whale Lord in next, we go for pedal dance again, hit through confusion, and one shot the giant whale. Jellicent meets the same fate. With minimal effort, we now have all eight Unovan gym badges. Unfortunately, that's also where the easy part of the run ends. Now it's time to confront Plasma for the final time. After all, they're trying to like freeze the world or some shit, and some people might not like that very much. We run into Colworth on the way, who gives us a small speech about the strange moose in front of us, then asks if we plan to confront Plasma. Not sure how to explain that we don't have much of a choice, we say yes, and he gives us a crab remote for controlling crabs. These two idiot grunts tell us exactly where to go, so we of course ignore that and head back to Castellia City to finally pick up our Eviolite and give it to Foghorn. We then catch ourselves a Surf user, since none of our current encounters can learn it apparently, and make our way to the next story beat. On the way, we catch ourselves a Mandyke. It's a baby Pokemon, so it won't be used, but it is a viable encounter, so why not? We name her Melissa and put her in the PC with our other misfit toys. Using our crab remote, we control a crab and then beat it to death with Penelope. This breaks the remote. Finally, we find the plasma for gate docked outside Route 21, and our rival meets us there. Marlin lowers the gangplank and allows us to board, so we do so with no hesitation and without a second thought. So basically, we have to learn a password from the grunts on board the ship to turn off these lasers in front of us. We do that by running through the cafeteria and beating them until they give us the answers we're looking for. But remember, we're the good guys here, so we do it nicely. Anyway, skipping a few grunt fights, we get the key card and the code, and now we can enter the back rooms of their ship. <laughs> I said back rooms. We can see where they've locked up Kiram and are using it to power their ice rays of destruction, so obviously we've got to stop that. First is another double battle against this purple sage idiot who never learns his lesson, and his little grunt too. They double into Sylvester, who takes it like a champ, while Samurai KOs Lipart in one hit with Aqua Tail. It really is kind of funny as he Dunspar side by side with a fully evolved starter this late into the game. Oh well. Watchdog is in next and we decide to protect because yes, they did double in Sylvester again. Thank you for asking. This heals us a little bit, but Aquatail misses, so I guess nothing else happened that turn. Sylvester gets frozen by Ice Beam on the next turn. I really just don't have much luck with that freeze chance, now do I? Aquatail KOs Kragonal, and Sylvester does actually thaw out and get Ancient Power into the Watchhog. We use our last protect and Samrot takes out the Watchhog with another Aquatail. Scolipede comes in next. We're finally forced to swap and bring in Foghorn, now boasting a ridiculous defense, and he tanks the two hits like they're nothing, while Samrot gets a critical hit against Kragonal and knocks it out. Weavile comes in, they double into Samurott, who lives with just 6 HP remaining, even after a critical hit. He KOs the Scolipede, and Foghorn power gems into the Weavile. It doesn't do a lot, but we are in no danger of ever being KO'd here, so this battle is as good as over. We are then ejected from the ship once more, and have to follow after it into the giant chasm. Our rival beats us there, and we're supposed to let the old space pirates try to convince the new space pirates that their leader is evil, but they seem to already know that and are very okay with it for some reason. Since this region is based on America, diplomacy of course fails, and we're forced to battle a few more grunts before moving on. The yellow sage guy gives us some max revives as some kind of sick and twisted joke, and they tackle the rest of the grunts so we can move on to their leader. First things first, we get our 50-50 encounter chance between Piloswine and Delibird. Granny the Delibird is sent to the BC. Our very next encounter is actually a pilot swine and I hold back tears as we move on. Once on board the ship again, we get ambushed into a quick double battle where Wow, they couldn't even bother to evolve their Pokemon. Okay, moving on. Here we have another laser puzzle to solve. This time we need to rearrange these pipes to step on switches that turn each laser off. This takes a significant amount of trial and error, but fortunately the grunts are pushovers. At least this guy is a crocodile. That's cool. Crocodile is cool. Once we get through that, we meet up with Purple Sage Captain Man again and see where Kiram is being held. Again. We have one last fight against this guy, and I swear he just doesn't get any tougher. We lead with Cast Form because I do expect Hydro Pump to do decent damage, and turning into a Water type will resist Ice Beam. But Kragonal actually gets a critical hit slash, and it does a bit more than I'm okay with, so we have to watch this closely. The second Kragonal also falls to two Hydro Pumps, only setting up a light screen in between. With Weavile out, we swap Foghorn in to tank everything it has, except Night Slash Crit does almost half. 
Well, guess we won't be walling this like I expected to. I decided to stay in and see how much power gem will do anyway but it isn't much of anything. Swapping in a Sylvester, we heal a bit of damage and get the Weave Output to sleep. A critical hit return gets the easy KO. Are critical hits more common in this gen than in gen four? Or was I just lucky last time? They seem to be popping up all over the place. Maybe I should play around them a bit better. Anyway, that wasn't the boss fight we're looking for. Just upstairs, Colrus is waiting for us. When you have the full context of everything, this guy being the boss of Plasma is kind of a big deal. But I mean, look at him, it's pretty obvious if you think about it. This is one of the hardest fights in the entire game. Like. This is the point where the game suddenly turns up to an 11 out of nowhere. A brief look at our team and strategy. We're actually relying a lot on Elmer, who boasts two stabs that are super effective against Colrus and Penelope, who can potentially boost her stats like crazy and heal a lot of damage off of their weaker special defense. Colrus lead Magneton is holding an Eviolite, making it exceptionally bulky. It's also fairly strong and carries Thunder Wave, meaning it's difficult to set up onto. We decide to lead Elmer, who gets the one shot with Earth Power after taking a try attack or it would be if not for Sturdy, but that's fine, as now Colrus is baited in the healing and we decide to go for Lava Plume for the burn chance on the next turn. We do actually get the burn, which means Magneton finally falls. Magnezone is in next, you know, same thing, but bigger. Flash Cannon doesn't do much thanks to the resist, but Lava Plume this time unfortunately does not get the burn. So Magnuson holds on with Sturdy. Expecting it to go for Explosion, we swap to Foghorn to take the hit. But for some reason it goes for Flash Cannon, which does way too much damage. Well, now what? Since Explosion is a normal type move, it should never be selecting it against Foghorn here. So we swap into Penelope, who I hope at full HP will just take one Flash Cannon, and she does. Now we can use Sucker Punch, and no matter what Magnuson is going for, we get the KO. Two down with three injured on my side. Kling Kling comes in next, and is holding an air balloon. This thing is crazy powerful, and we don't really have a solid answer to it given that it outspeeds most of my Pokemon, but we are able to swap in Sylvester, who fortunately avoids a Giga Impact. We then yawn while Kling Kling goes for shift gear and protect just to make sure it falls asleep. However, it does get a second shift gear in instead. As soon as this thing wakes up, it's killing something. Good to know. We swap to Elmer, who should be able to get a KO with Lava Plume and put this behind us so it woke up. Well, thank you for your sacrifice, Elmer. Now we get a free switch and a free turn, but to do what? What else do I have to hit this with? We bring Sylvester back in and use Ancient Power on Klee Kling's recharge turn. I don't want to put it to sleep right away as I expect us to be able to take at least one hit. Leftovers should be able to heal after we do put it to sleep, and I want to optimize our odds of Ancient Power boosts. Kling Kling goes for a third shift gear while we hit Ancient Power. Still no boost. It hits the next turn with Thunderbolt while we hit Yawn. We're nearly at full HP. I could protect here, but I mean, at four levels higher, do I still survive a hit? The answer is yes. Unfortunately, Gear Grind hits twice. We don't survive the second hit, but I technically wasn't wrong. Sylvester falls. Kling Kling falls asleep, so we have at least one turn where it will stay that way, or should. Tweety swaps in, sets up Rain, and fires off a Hydro Pump. That misses. Okay. Because we're a water type, Culver should be going for a good get impact here over Gear Grind, but because we're holding a Focus Sash, we will always live the one hit KO that this sees. This is exactly what happens, but the second Hydro Pump also misses. It's fine. It's fine. Kling Kling needs a turn to recharge, and since third time's the charm, we hit our stab, rain boosted Hydro Pump, and finally KO the Kling Kling. Not able to risk the switch into Penelope, we stay in with Tweety's one HP and KO Behem with Hydro Pump. It owed me the hit after already missing twice, okay? Mateng is probably Colrus's weakest Pokemon, but that doesn't mean it isn't scary. We swap into Marvin since the rain disappeared, and Meteng goes for agility. Marvin hits the U-turn and swaps into Foghorn, while Meteng goes for another agility. Meteng then goes for Meteor Mash, letting Foghorn survive on 15 HP and retaliate with Earth Power, which puts Meteng below half. Now we have to swap or we lose Foghorn. Marvin switches in, avoids the Meteor Mash, but unfortunately falls to Zen Headbutt, which takes him out in one hit. Rest in peace, Marvin, we hardly knew ye. Fortunately now, Penelope is able to come in, and while I'm not sure if Sucker Punch will KO this range, it doesn't matter as Meteor Mash Ash misses and Giga Drain picks up the KO. Three deaths. Three deaths. That's more deaths in one fight than in the entirety of my last F tier Nuzlocke. Check it out by clicking here. It's heartbreaking to lose Sylvester. He was somebody I expected to carry us all the way to the end. And Elmer, though a new addition, was somebody I was relying on to hit like a truck. And he did. But luck was not on his side when it mattered most. They will both be sorely missed. And it's not over. We aren't even healed before we face Jetsus, who gives us his whole villain speech before sicking his shadow triad goons on us. I didn't even know this was a fight right away or I would have healed my team my damn self. We lead our half health Penelope, who spams acupressure until getting a special attack boost, then one shot the Ponyard. Faint attack still hits even after the evasion boost since it never misses, but we heal enough to make up for the two we took. Abs all in next and we dodge the Night Slash before KOing with Giga Train. A second Ponyard comes in and dies the same as the first. Thank goodness. Inside the heart of Giant Chasm, we confront Jetsus. And the coolest cutscene in the history of Pokemon plays out in front of us.
And now we have to fight that thing. God, these games are so cool. We heal up and challenge the behemoth. And we can't catch it either. Just a good old fashioned round of fisticuffs, mano a mano. Kiram isn't weak to ice, but a neutral stab blizzard is still the strongest attack I have to use against it at this point. And I know I can get it off once since Tweety is holding another focus sash. And we can get even more use out of it as Kiram goes for freeze burn, which is a two turn move needing to charge. We get hail set up and fire off a blizzard before Kiram gets to hit us in return. But it doesn't even do half, but we have to stay and get as much damage in as possible. But we luck out. Kiram goes for freeze burn a second time, meaning Tweety is free to pick up the KO with a third blizzard. That was scary and very well could have ended horribly. I don't know if Kiram prioritizes its new moves in this form or what, but I'll take whatever victory I can get at this point. Kiram falls, releases Reshiram, and runs off. The gauntlet still isn't over, however, as now, we actually have to fight Chetsis. The game does throw you a bone and heal your team at this point, but since three of my Pokemon are still dead, this doesn't really mean great things for us here. It's Tweety, Penelope, and Foghorn against the world. A cast form, Maractus, and Nosepass. Dear God, what have we gotten ourselves into? We are a little lucky though, given how the fight with Kiram went, our Focus Sash is still intact, so we stay in and set up Hail while Copagrigus goes for Toxic. It then protects and heals the Hail Chip with leftovers while we begin to waste away from poison damage. Blizzard does finally connect the next turn and deals decent damage, but a Shadow Ball puts Cast Form in real danger. Where we're sitting now, Copagrigus sees a KO with Shadow Ball, so it isn't likely to protect, but even if it does protect, I'm certain we survive another round of Toxic damage, so there's no downside to staying in and waiting for the knockout, which we get putting down Jetsus' first. Pokemon. With Electros in next, we swap into Foghorn. I know Penelope is going to be our win con for this fight, especially now with Tweety out of mission, but since Electros has Acrobatics and Flamethrower, I don't want to waste the HP we have if I can help it. But since Foghorn deals almost no damage against this, we get a slow Volt switch into Penelope, doing our best to set her up for success. She capitalizes, not only outspeeding, but getting the boost on special attack instantly and tanking a Flamethrower with a third HP remaining. Now our plus two stab Miracle Seed boosted Giga Drain can get the one hit KO and bring her health back up to two thirds instead. We're not out of this one yet. In fact, Seismitone is in next. Free food for Penelope, but it does have Sludge Wave, so unfortunately it isn't entirely free for us to set up more Accupressures on. We do go for one just to try, but I guess our luck has run out since it hits the attack buff instead of literally any other stat. Giga Drain heals back the damage and snags the KO. Drapion is in next and it does resist all of our moves. But since we're at plus two and seven levels higher, we just try to brute force through with Giga Drain. We heal back to full, but X Scissor drops us below half again. We have the KO, but with how little HP Drapion has left, we aren't going to get another massive heal off and that could really pose a problem. Except Jetsis swoops in to save the day using a full restore to give us a massive health boost. And then we still outspeed the next turn for a bit more healing and a free KO. Thank you, Jetsis. Toxicroak comes in next and it's a rinse and repeat. Our first Giga Drain knocks him to yellow and he retaliates with a poison jab, which KOs Penelope. Right up there with Sylvester, this was a Pokemon I really thought was too good for this run, that they would carry us all the way to the end. To fall to a poison jab, not boosted, not a crit, at full HP, there's nothing more I could have done. This may very well be where the run ends. Foghorn comes out and takes a Sucker Punch, but it does get the Revenge KO with Earth Power. Unfortunately, Jessus has one Pokemon left, and it's his scariest one, Hydreigon. One lonely nose pass staring down the run killer of all run killers. He never stood a chance. Dragon Rush hits, but Foghorn hangs on. He retaliates with a critical hit powered gem. Hydreigon is down to almost half HP. Is there a chance? The second Dragon Rush misses, there is a god he is watching now and he is cheering for Foghorn. This is his moment. A second critical hit power gem. Hydreigon only has one third of his HP left, but this time Jetsus wises up. He isn't playing. He doesn't risk the Dragon Rush that was giving us a chance, and Crunch gets the KO on Foghorn. I can't fault the guy. He really put in his best work, and then some. But we do have one last trick up our sleeve. Tweety may only be on 11 HP and poisoned, but she is still alive, and Foghorn did enough damage. I bet Hydro Pump KOs at this range. I'm sure we outspeed. Is the 80% chance enough? Will this run continue? There's no choice but to try. Hydro Pump hits. Hydragon balls. The end of the battle ticks away with Tweety as the lone survivor. Truly a story to be told for all time. And in Jetsis have a weird heart to heart moment while I'm grieving over the loss of five of our best possible team members. Now it's just a matter of picking up the pieces. N wants us to challenge the Pokemon League, but can we? I'm honestly not sure that this run can continue to limp forward, but we do have a few Pokemon in the box and what? Am I going to let those deaths be for nothing? Every misstep I took still led me forward. It doesn't matter how many times you stumble, because if you can still cross the finish line, it means you still had the strength to pick yourself back up.
Meet the new team. Tweety stays on doing exactly what Tweety does. The star, the leader, the one who held on when nobody else could. Firing off 100% blizzards in the hail and powerful hydro pumps in the rain. We wouldn't be here without the raw power of cast form. Not a sentence I ever thought I'd say. Daffy makes his grand return. After having been overshadowed by Penelope, his newly evolved form gives him a few tricks to work with. Protect, Leech Seed, Toxic, while not the most noble of movesets, give him good survivability when partnered with leftovers to allow him to whittle down even the tankiest of threats. Lola the Delcaddy, who saw some brief use off and on, finally makes the final squad. With Fake Out, Toxic, and Sing, she wants to get in, cause some havoc however the situation calls for it, and get out again to do it later. Paired to Daffy, it isn't a bad strategy, though her frailty makes getting in difficult. She's given the Life Orb item to make the most of her Fake Out and Return, allowing her to hit hard when necessary. Melissa also makes the team a baby Pokemon in the Elite Four. I know it's crazy, but with a Choice Scarf, Dual Stab, Hydro Pump, and Air Slash gives her a decent shot at picking up quick and easy revenge kills, and her typing actually makes for some easy switch-ins depending on the opponent. Sam is welcomed back to the team, carrying on the Eviolite legacy from Foghorn before him. With decent mixed defenses, Toxic and Protect, it fits right into the strategy that we've set up with Daffy and Lola. Stone Edge allows it to hit hard if ever necessary, and his bulk is invaluable and absolutely necessary for the team. And last but not least, we have Pepe. With a choice band, poison jab, crunch, and bulldoze, he's just about raw physical power when necessary. Don't let his middling attack stat fool you. This guy has a solid purpose that will make him invaluable against the Elite Four. But before we get there, we have to get through Victory Road. The Gen 5 games have the coolest badge checkpoint thingy, though maybe it is a little over the top. There's quite a few mandatory battles here, but fortunately none of them pose too much of an issue. Daffy stalls out most threats, Lola sees action with Fake Out in return, and we're able to make it pretty safely out of Victory Road. Except for one thing. We actually do have a rival fight before we reach the LE4. Crazy, right? We haven't fought this guy since his Oshawa days. We lead Tweety against his unpheasant and set up Hail while he goes for Swagger. Fortunately, we outspeed, don't hit ourselves in confusion, and get the one hit KO with Blizzard. Simi Sage comes in next and falls in exactly the same way. Bouflant is pretty scary, but with our Focus Sash still intact, we stay in, fire off a Blizzard, and a critical hit head charge activates our Sash. Oh boy. Next turn arrival heals, we get a free blizzard off, and it actually freezes the poor bison. With hail over, we go for Hydro Pump, which surprisingly does not kill, but Bouflant remains frozen. Look at that, never punished. But not risking fate further, we swap to Lola, who eats a wild charge with surprising ease, and get the KO with fake out. Samurott comes in next, and Lola barely takes a surf before getting off a toxic to start eating into his large HP pool. Citrus Berry activates, so we swap into Daffy, expecting a second surf. Protecting the next turn to gain back some HP and let poison rack up, we stay in. Samurott goes for revenge instead of ice beam for some reason and our Leech Seed starts to add to the passive damage. See what I mean about stalling out? I realize it isn't the most exciting or flashy way to win a fight, but win fights it does. And when you're working with limited resources, you go with what you've got. A last Protect puts Daffy back at full HP, and Samurott falls to poison damage. And that's all she wrote. Not sure why he doesn't have a full team, but oh well. We finally made it to the Pokemon League. This run should have died at Jetsus, but since we came back from the brink of death, it's time to see how far we can really take this. The Elite Four is broken into two problem members, Caitlyn and Marshall, and two pushovers, Grimsley and Chantal. In my mind, I'm thinking it's better to tackle the problem members first in case something goes wrong later so that I have the most resources to work with. So we start with Caitlyn. I know I said in the last video that I would be trying to match each member of the Elite Four as I go, but that really doesn't work when you can choose any Elite Four member and they're all the same level. So we just use the traditional level cap of the Champion's Ace and move on without thinking about it too hard. Caitlyn leads with Musharna, who we can't poison thanks to Synchronize or else we end up poisoned ourselves. But since this has Yawn, and I know it's going to prioritize that until we fall asleep, we set up a Leech Seed so we can get the damage rolling. After becoming Drowsy, we swap into Lola and Musharna goes for another Yawn. So it's like that, is it? We swap again into Daffy, who takes another Yawn and and swap into Lola when Musharna finally goes for Reflect, all the while Leech Seed chipping away at their HP. Lola's Life Orb boosted Fake Out does decent damage even through Reflect, and Return just barely misses the KO. Musharna again goes for Yawn, but at last Leech Seed finally takes it out. With Re and Inkless in next, I'm not sure if this will go straight for Focus Blast, or if Psychic deals enough damage here for the KO. Knowing he'll take either one, we swap into Sam, who eats the Focus Blast with HP to spare, but that's about all he can do with it. Now I'm expecting Energy Ball, so we have the swap into Melissa, but Re and Inkless actually goes for Focus Blast and does very little with it. Unfortunately, however, I don't expect Melissa to deal any damage here, and her defenses aren't enough to take a Psychic. Knowing our efforts are wasted, we hard swap into Daffy, who takes a Psychic, then Protect to get a bit of healing in before going for Giga Drain. The incoming Psychic does scary damage, and I know this isn't going to last very long. Re and Eclis does go for a random move on our next Protect turn, 
but after that, I'm pretty sure it'll be forced to go for Psychic. So we swap to Lola, who takes the hit and attacks with a strong fake out. At this range, thanks to Rian Eclipse's low physical defense, Return gets the KO. That was a really sloppy way to play around his diverse moveset. If I want this run to have any chance, I really need to step it up for my Pokemon, for the Fallen Ones, for the viewers at home, but most importantly, for myself. I can do this. Sigilyph is in next. After some quick maths, it's a shaky workaround. My cast form should survive two hits. That's enough to get in, set up hail, and KO with Blizzard. So we do that. Always play to your outs. Gothitelle is in next, and it's the frisky variety, not the tagging variety. So we swap into Melissa, who has the most remaining HP. And while she does take the Shadow Ball well, her special defense drops, and I know she can't stay in. But I don't have a safe switch either. So despite it being our first member challenged, we are forced to allow Melissa to go down for a safe switch. I don't know what I expect from a baby Pokemon on the team, but it certainly wasn't a critical hit. One hit KO Hydro Pump. God damn, the team lives another day. But that was a strong wake up call. It's time to start playing for keeps. <laughs> keeps. I decide that instead of going for Marshall next, maybe I should take on the pushover members before I lose anybody and they become not pushovers instead. Honestly, I'm flip-flopping a lot on what the best order would be to take on these guys, but at the end of the day, we have to take them all out, so let's just do what feels right at the time. That means Grimsley is next. He leads with Lipard while we lead with Lola. Love me a good cat fight. But unfortunately, despite being higher leveled, Lola is still slower than Lipard, and we flinch the first turn. Night Slash hits next, and we retaliate by putting the cat to sleep. Now we should have the safest switch possible in the Tweety, who we are ultimately relying on to power through a lot of the Elite Four for us. And this time we set up a rain dance. The rain boosted Hydro Pump is enough to take out the Lipard before it wakes up. And next comes in Crookdial, who we also outspeed and KO with another Hydro Pump. I'm getting some weird deja vu. Scrafty comes in next and just barely survives, hitting back with Rock Tomb and reducing our speed. But no matter. Now Grimsley wants to heal, so we are free to try our luck with another Hydro Pump, which not only hits, but crits taking Scrafty down. Bisharp is in next and is entirely the reason why we didn't hail for this sweep, but now that the rain is gone, we can either set it up again or switch. We decide to set it up again since we still have speed. Night Slash does bring us down to yellow, but a boosted Hydro Pump on Bisharp's weaker defenses is more than enough for the KO. That one we weren't worried about, and though some risks were definitely taken, I think that's something Grimsley would appreciate from us. Next, we take on Chantal. Her Kafagrigus lead does give some brief PTSD, but we've got Pepe now, and he is here entirely to fuck shit up. Choice Ban Super Effective Crunch isn't enough for the KO, but but we do dodge the Will-O-Wisp, so I'll take it. A second crunch puts the coffin in the dirt. Golurk comes in next, unsurprisingly, and here we have a free switch into Melissa. Unfortunately, Surf doesn't get the KO in this range, but Hydro Pump does. So risking the mist, but landing on the right side of history, we get the KO, and Golurk goes down without so much as a pebble thrown. Drift Blim is a bit more of an issue, but we swap into Daffy to take the resisted Thunderbolt, though unfortunately we are paralyzed for our troubles. No matter. We tank one Acrobatics and set up Leech Seed, then, not risking a full para just for a Protect turn, we swap into Sam. Acrobatics literally does less damage than Leech Seed heals, so we get a Toxic in as well to really start racking up the damage. Shadow Ball hurts, but doesn't drop our special defense, so we stay in with a Protect the next turn. Chantal on this turn is either going to heal or shadow ball. Either way, we want to hit a stone edge. So we do and get the KO while remaining at full health. Chandelure comes in next and threatens us with an energy ball. So we risk it all and swap into Melissa, who takes the neutral hit with half HP remaining. Again, Surf does not see the KO, but Hydro Pump does. So we take the chance and hit the target. Luck really is trying to make up those previous misses to me, huh? Chandelure falls and we're now three Elite Four members deep without a single loss on this B-list F tier team. But remember how I said Marshall was a problem? Because we still have to deal with that guy. He's Throw is scary for our team because of guts, so we start with a Leech Seed while he hits Circle Throw. We then protect the next turn to get most of our health back. Now we just want to spam Giga Drain to stay ahead of the damage, which for the most part we do, and throw falls without too much effort. Man Xiao hits like a truck with High Jump Kick, but with Protect, we can force it to hurt itself instead, so we lead with that. We decide to bring in Pepe, who won't die to the attack, but I'm hoping we'll go low enough to bait Man Xiao into using a different move. It works perfectly. We get the swap into Sam while Man Xiao uses Retaliate. Now he can use Protect to safely avoid High Jump Kick and Man Xiao falls to the recoil damage. Conkelder is in next and is the biggest problem of the team. With Guts, Bulk Up, and a Citrus Berry, this thing is going to be nearly impossible to whittle down. Unfortunately, there isn't much of a choice in the matter. Since Conkelder doesn't see a KO with Hammer Arm thanks to Sam's crazy Bulk, it's always going for Bulk Up here. We can't afford to swap now, so we Toxic. This will allow us to turn off his next turn, as with the plus one boost from Bulk Up and the Guts boost, Marshall will see the KO and be forced to Hammer Arm, meaning our Protect will be effective and we can start racking up poison damage. But the next turn, we're going to be forced to switch. And unfortunately, despite her resisting the move, the Conkelder is too much for Melissa to take, 
and she goes down to hammer arm. I can't say it wasn't expected, but Melissa put in some great work for us and we wouldn't have gotten to this point without her. A man tyke of all things. But to move forward, we have to make the hard choices and there was no getting through Marshall's Conkeldor without a sacrifice. Losing a Pokemon to the last Elite Four member twice in a row does sting just a bit though, you know? Daffy comes in, protects to keep up the poison damage and get back to full HP and also proc Conkeldor Citrus Berry. Now all the tricks are truly out of the way, but it isn't enough. We can't risk Daffy. We need to switch. And unfortunately, our other members are too valuable to risk, and Pepe falls as well. With his sacrifice, we are free to bring in Lola, get a flinch with Fake Out, and force Conkeldur to fall to poison. And unfortunately, that's not where the battle ends, as Sot comes out next. We swap out a Sam who takes the Brick Break fairly well. Then, after a bit of scouting, we hit the Toxic to start the process all over again. Except this time, without Guts. We swap in a Daffy and decide instead of protecting to go straight for the Giga Drain, knowing we take a second Brick Break and get the critical hit KO. Finally, Marshall Falls. A hard fought battle, but a battle won nonetheless. The eight gym leaders are defeated, Plasma is defeated, Jetsus is defeated, Kiram is defeated, the Elite Four is defeated. There have been highs, there have been lows, friends lost along the way, it all comes down to this. The Pokemon White 2 F tier Nuzlocke. Can it be completed? Only one way to find out. As we heal and rearrange the team, we have one small trickling of a plan forming. The Water Molecule Who Could, Tweety Bird, will lead the charge. But I can't help but find it all too fitting that despite other Pokemon like Sylvester and Penelope becoming stars of the show for most of the run, we're right back where it all started. Daffy the Sunkern started this run, and one way or another, Daffy the Sunflora will end it. Deep breath. Here we go. Iris leads with Hydreigon, while we lead with Tweety. For this fight specifically, we swap Tweety's item for a Citrus Berry, since Hydreigon never gets the one hit, so Focus Ash never really has much of a use. We start with setting up Hail, and Dragon Pulse does just enough to activate our Citrus Berry. Could not have planned that better if I tried. And now, we Blizzard. Like Drayden before her, Iris' Dragon falls in one hit. We're off to a running start. Funny thing about Pokemon AI, and at least Jen's three through five, I believe, the AI will want to bring in a Pokemon that has a super effective move, but they will always send in the one weakest to the type of Pokemon you have. For example, in this instance, Iris will always bring out Drudigan, as it is weak to ice, but has Focus Blast, which is a super effective move. It's a weird quirk that I don't need to exploit too often, or can't in a lot of cases, but I will absolutely use it here to get an advantage and pick up a second one-hit KO against the champion. Four to go. Archeops is in next. I don't have any particularly good answers for this besides risking the Hydro Pump, but knowing I'll likely need that later, we make the safe switch into Sam. All Archeops can do here is Dragon Claw, so we take the chance to use Stone Edge and activate Archeops' defeatist ability, cutting its attack in half whenever it drops below half HP. Now we are free to whittle away Archeops HP slowly and not worry about hitting every Stone Edge, but the next turn, Iris uses a full restore to heal Archeops. However, our second Stone Edge hits anyway and defeatist reactivates. We hit a third Stone Edge and pick up the KO. Lapras is in next, and I know we don't have a switch in here. Sam does get off the Toxic before falling to Ice Beam, but that's the most that can be done. Thank you, Sam. You did what you had to do. Daffy comes in next and we protect to avoid the Ice Beam. Then Lapras actually goes for Sing, which thankfully misses while we set up Leech Seed. The next turn, Leech Seed and Poison Damage bring Lapras down to red, and I know another heal is coming. Really should have stalled those out of Archeops when we had the chance. We swap to Lola predicting this, but surprisingly, Iris doesn't heal and Lapras goes for Sing instead, which again misses. Lapras then falls to poison damage. Well, that was certainly interesting. I have no idea how AI decides to heal or not, but I guess it doesn't take priority over the status moves they love so much. Aggron is in next, who we hit with Fake Out, because why not? Damage is damage. We then hard switch back into Daffy, not wanting to risk a Sing miss of our own, and easily tank the double edge. Honestly, not sure why I didn't protect first turn here. Nerves getting to me, I suppose. But we do take a second double edge and set up Leech Seed, so that's fine. Protect puts us at a great HP range, and we're able to get Giga Drain off the next turn to stay above half HP. Agron falls to Leech Seed damage on the next turn. Iris only has one Pokemon left, but Haxorus is no pushover. With Dragon Dance, this can get out of control quickly, but we do have a win condition here. Two actually, but I don't want to risk Tweety having to hit a 70% accurate Blizzard. We Toxic, just hoping to survive a single x -Scissor, which we do. Now, Haxorus is on a timer. A race against the clock that it cannot win. Iris didn't heal before, not sure why she would now. We make the only play we can and double protect succeeds. There's no chance of a third happening in a row, but Daffy accepts a noble death. The damage is done. Lola is free to come in, flinch the Haxorus with Fake Out, and the poison damage does him in. Iris has no more Pokemon that can battle. Player defeated. Champion. Iris. This was an amazing run. It truly showcased how powerful some of these Pokemon really can be, but also shows why they just don't get going when the going gets tough. But that's fine, because every Pokemon has some kind of trick it can pull out if it really needs to. And I think once we are forced to really scrape the bottom of the barrel, you got to see that strategy will take you just as far as brute strength. Well, unless you're a Delibird. Sorry, Delibird. You stay in the box where you belong. Vanilla Pokemon games are easy. Easy enough that the worst of the worst can clear one, 
despite the casualties sustained along the way. This was my second recorded Nuzlocke for the channel. If you enjoyed it, check out my F tier Platinum run or check out some of these other videos I've done and consider subscribing. If you have suggestions for other challenge runs you'd like me to try, leave a comment down below. I always love hearing your suggestions. Until then, thank you all so much for watching and I will catch y'all in the next run. See ya.